Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, October 25th, 2021. Coming up on the show today, from No Time to Die, editor Tom Cross. Elliot and I had a lot of conversations about, could we remove this? Could you remove that? Ultimately, we both came to the conclusion collectively that the bones of that sequence needed to all be there. And editor Elliot Graham. We knew there was going to be a discussion of, can it be cut? Can it be flashbacks? Can it be done differently? Can it be cut down? And no matter the length of the film, it was clear that you really had to have this for the weight of the story to work. Yes, all that and a lot more on this episode of The Rough Cut. All right, well, what's up, Rough Cutters? You getting ready for Halloween later this week? Got your costume picked out? Got the candy ready for the trick-or-treaters? No? Well, don't panic. You still got a few days, but get on it. We, that is you and me, have a real treat today on the podcast. It's Bond, James Bond. Well, actually, it's Cross, Tom Cross, and Graham, Elliot Graham. And together they edited the latest entry of the 007 franchise, the long-awaited No Time to Die. This film has the distinction of being the 25th film in the official James Bond canon, and the fifth and final film in the run of Daniel Craig playing the part of the iconic secret agent. Now, whether you're a big fan or a casual fan or... I guess even indifferent to the Bond movies, the likelihood that you need the concept explained to you is remote, so I won't spend any time on that. But I will talk a little about today's guests. First up is our friend from the film First Man, and that would be Tom Cross. Tom was on the rough cut a while back to talk about First Man, and I think you'd enjoy that one quite a bit. So give it a listen if you have the time after this one. You have also, well, you and a lot of other people, have also seen Tom's Oscar-winning and Oscar-nominated work in the films Whiplash and La La Land both of which directed by Damien Chazelle, whom Tom is currently cutting for on his upcoming film, Babylon. Also on the podcast today is Elliot Graham, a very talented editor in his own right. And if you check out his IMDb page, you're going to see he's got a lot of range. Right out of the gate in his career, he was editing X2, X-Men United with editor John Ottman. And from there, he would go on to do other superhero flicks like Superman Returns, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and Captain Marvel. But it wasn't all capes and cowls for Elliot. He also did a lot of dramatic fare like Molly's Game, and the film for which he was nominated for an Oscar, Milk, which was the biopic that starred Sean Penn as gay rights activist and politician Harvey Milk. So with all those films to their credits, you can see what a formidable editing team that Tom and Elliot are, and what a great team they would be to take on No Time to Die. Lots to talk about with those guys, but before we do, a few quick words about the folks that helped to bring you this interview with Tom and Elliot. First up is Massive. When it comes to moving media, you gotta have the agents from Massive on your team. They are your not-so-secret weapon when it comes to solving your most challenging media problems. What problems? Well, how about finding a way to easily, safely, and efficiently share even the most enormous of media files that result from you shooting all that high-res media? Other cloud file transfer solutions only let you share files up to a couple hundred gigabytes. Not massive. With them, there are no limits to the size of the files you can share, and you can even do it through your own customized media transfer portal. You know, you put your logo on it, make it look real pretty. You can even send uncompressed videos to the rest of your operatives all over the world and speed up your production cycle. No shipping hard drives all around, no complex servers to set up. Plus, Massive's pay-as-you-go model means you only pay for what you need. And if you're worried about your precious media getting into the wrong hands, do not. As a member of the Trusted Partner Network's roster of vendors, you know that Massive is a proven service that protects you from data breaches. And if you sign up today at massive.io slash the rough cut, you can get 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. I will put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you, but once again, that's massive.io slash the-rough-cut for 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. And now that you have access to the very best way to share media amongst your production team, make sure that you have the very best in production audio to share as well. And for that, you know you can turn to our friends at Extreme Music. For over 20 years, they have been providing content creators with amazing music created by the top names in the production and composing game. You got Junkie XL, Bear McCurry, Shelby Lynn, Paul Oakenfold, and of course, No Time to Die composer Hans Zimmer. Just visit their website, ExtremeMusic.com, and do a quick keyword search on just about every aspect of music to find just what you need. Their deep catalog is customizable right down to the instrumentation of the track so that you get just what you want in a way that suits your story best. You want to kick that bongo player out of the band? No problem. Just use a version of the track without the bongos, if the track has bongos. It is free to try, it is fun to do, and it is the very best way for you to ensure that your project sounds great. You can take care of the licensing all online or with a live representative at an office near you all around this world of ours. So do not wait. The next time you have a great story to tell, visit Extreme Music and get their musical muscle power behind your next mission. All right, our next mission is already here, and that's to learn all about cutting No Time to Die. Here are editors Tom Cross and Elliot Graham. How far should we go back? 
I didn't fit in in high school. Oh, God. <laughs> There's a lot of people who work in the arts who don't. Uh. That's not part of this interview. <laughs> mm. In the past 18 months, it's become quite routine to talk about a film being delayed by as much as even 18 months. But No Time to Die had its own challenges getting out of the starting blocks dating back to 2018. There was a change in directors. There was a change in scripts. Carrie Fukunaga took over and principal photography finally commenced in April 2019 and then wrapped in October. So, Elliot, I think you actually worked with Carrie as an additional editor on Beasts of No Nation. So maybe we should start with you. Right. Yeah. Um, and additional sort of weird word. Um, I didn't take a credit on it. Um, I was uh, the editor. I was the editor for all of production. And uh, my back had gone out twice on the previous uh, film. And then it went out in Africa. And I, I, I had had two injections. You can't have a third. So I finished all of production. I did all of it. And I just waived the credit because I felt so bad. I'd never left the film before. And I thought, you know what? They'll get the best editor possible if the person doesn't have to share credit. Now, it may seem like a stupid thing to do, but I've always felt like giving away credit's better than like taking it. And hey, look, here we were working together again on Bond. So I'm proud of the work I did in that movie. And uh, I was in Africa the whole time. And um, here we are now. And Tom, having no prior experience working with Carrie that I can tell, Tell me about the process for getting to know a director you're working with for the first time, the interview component, as well as figuring out the way that you two are going to collaborate. Well, I was a fan of Kerry's work, so I definitely knew he was someone I would love to try to work with. And I actually met him in New York when I was editing Scott Cooper's film Hostiles. Scott and his producer, John Lesher, invited like three directors to come look at a rough cut and give notes. And one of the directors was Kerry. And then we went out to dinner and we talked about the movie, all of us. So in a way, I did get to know him a little bit, having creative conversations with him in that way. I really had no idea if he remembered me or not. And so when it was announced that Carrie was going to direct, I was picking up my phone to call my agent and say, is there anything we can do to throw my name in the hat? And I was just coming off of First Man and a special screening of First Man Private screening was arranged for uh, the producers, Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson and Carrie, and they were going to look at Lena Sandgren's work. Lena Sandgren being the cinematographer of First Man and then became the cinematographer of No Time to Die. So they looked at his work, and I think along the way, because my agent was also trying to push my name into the fray, I think somewhere in there they were also made a decision about me and figured, okay, maybe this is someone we could bring on and collaborate with Elliot because I think Elliot was already going to do the picture. Yeah. So that's kind of how it started. And it's always a challenge with new directors, just getting your feet wet and getting to know how they like to work and stuff like that. And one amazing thing, of course, was having Elliot was extremely beneficial because Elliot had worked with Carrie before, knew him. And Elliot and I had tons of conversations about how to approach things creatively and yeah. what's the process like with Carrie. Well, I had no idea Elliot had some experience with that. So I found that very beneficial. I always like to start off these discussions exploring any sort of reference films or material that the director may have given the editors. But in the case of this film, you have 24 other films in the canonical franchise to reference. So with that in mind, I'd like to know if there were any particular Bond films that Carrie felt embodied the spirit of what he was after in No Time to Die, or did you just really sort of throw out the rule book and start over? You know, I think a big important thing to Carrie and to the producers was to wrap up Daniel Craig's tenure. So, you know, Ellie and I, we all come at this as Bond fans, yeah. but we really focused on Daniel's movies in particular. So Ellie and I, on our own, rewatched Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, Skyfall, Spectre, because we knew it was important to tie up Daniel Craig's arc as Bond. We knew that was an important thing to Carrie and to the producers and to Daniel. If there was any other stray reference, it would be Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And that, I know, is one of Carrie's favorite Bond movies. I think his other one, other favorite might be Casino Royale, but definitely Honor Majesty's Secret Service was something that was brought up. Because there are references and little connections that were written, have always been in the script. But definitely, besides sort of those touchstones, Daniel's movies, that was absolutely something that was important to us. So, Elliot, when you and Tom were first getting to know each other and figuring out how you were going to approach this film, how do you balance out the workload? Who did what, and what was the approach you took to getting the film done? Yeah, I think I've done probably more films from beginning to end than Tom with other editor, and 
for the most part, I've loved it. Like John Ottman, who I started my career with, is one of my best friends to this day. You know, some people split the film half and half and, you know, love that. Sometimes I feel like you can tell the shift in style ever so slightly. The way Tom and I did it is basically the way I've just done it with, with every editor I've worked with, and it's just been the way we've naturally discussed doing it, which is whoever's available will take what comes in. But we'll make sure that both of us get some action, some drama, some scenes we care about, and that it's fair, and then we'll share ideas with each other as we go. And, you know, uh, you know, at a certain point, if, if things are tight, one of us can tighten each other's scenes, however it works out best, because the film ultimately should be one voice. And nobody knows watching the film who cut what. They don't care. They just want it to feel good. So we were very, tried to be very just, you know, humble about sharing it with each other, and that worked for us. Yeah. You know, one thing that was great about working with Elliot on No Time to Die, I mean, there were two of us. So, you know, each of us could kind of work on scenes a little more, I won't say luxuriously, but we had a little more time to finesse things uh, as we put them together and not just have to, you know, do triage where we're just trying to keep up with camera. I mean, that's always a challenge, keeping up with camera. But it was kind of wonderful that we could both kind of carry the loads. And also, both of us really cut a little bit of everything in the movie. So we both did action stuff. We both did drama stuff. We both did those scenes where people are talking on the telephone or the intercom. You know, we, bo- we, did, we all did a little bit of everything, which was great. So franchises like Star Wars and even Marvel to a somewhat lesser extent, they have certain signatures to their style and their aesthetic. You know, for Star Wars, you have the opening crawls and the wipes and probably a few other things that I'm forgetting. Do the Bond movies have any stylistic components that you're conscious of either embracing or avoiding when making this film? Well, Tom's the one who could talk more (laughs) about all of the tropes because as much as I've watched every Bond movie and love them and this is a dream come true, he simply knows all there is to know of Bond lore. Um, I, um, obviously, there's a gun barrel. There's the opening credit sequence. Other than that, yes, we have a unique opening. I don't care about the tropes. I don't care about the specifics in any franchise, whether it's Marvel or Bond or what have you, I care about what serves that movie and that story the best. Now, we have a gun barrel, we have an opening credit sequence, and I would not change that. Other than that, I do not care, as long as we're serving our story the best we possibly can. Um, And yes, we have a unique opening that's longer than usual and doesn't start with James Bond, and we can talk about that. Well, two things that Bond movies are definitely known for, the opening set piece and the main title sequences. You know, generally, I say generally because I'm generalizing, and this is probably truer for older Bond films, that opening set piece is pretty quick. It takes place in the present time and is not always directly related to the plot of the film. You know, its sole purpose is kind of to jumpstart the energy of the film right away and get audiences into the action. That is not exactly the case in No Time to Die, so it's a bit of a departure. You know, there's about 22 minutes of movie before we get to the titles. Opening movies is always hard, so I'd like to hear a short description of the open for the sake of anyone that hasn't seen the film, and then just the challenge you guys faced in getting that open right and any changes it might have gone through along the way. Sure. Well, the film does open, uh, you know, not featuring James Bond, which is a big deal um, for James Bond films. And um, it opens with a young Madeline Swan, his love interest in the films, you know, uh, as a child. Um, It was shot in Norway, uh, but it's sort of a little horror scene, to be honest, with a masked man who turns out to be Saf and later the villain of the movie, killing young Madeline's mother and stalking her. And, you know, she falls into ice. And he has the choice to kill her or save her, and uh, he saves her. And there's a match cut from um, her as a young girl being pulled out of the icy water to um, her as an adult with Bond um, coming out of water in the Mediterranean. And a love story ensues. Uh, that opening on a film that's, you know, a bit long, is we knew there was going to be a discussion of, can it be cut? Can it be flashbacks? Can it be done differently? Can it be cut down? And ultimately, no matter the length of the film, and that's a whole different conversation, it was clear that you really had to have this for the weight of the story to work, for it to make sense. Similarly, you had to have the romance then followed pre-titles between them, or the rest of the movie doesn't work, the ending doesn't pay off. And then, of course, we have the action, which is, you know steeped in drama and, 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 and the train uh, moment where he you know sends Madeline off because he doesn't trust her because she might be part of Spectre. It is a long opening from the moment of the beginning after the gun barrel with young Madeline to going to Vesper's grave, his love interest from Casino Royale, and this romance paying off and then being torn apart in action. And uh, that is unique to Bond. Simultaneously, as a storyteller, I don't care. I do care about the pace of the film and the duration and how people feel at the end. But in terms of when the credits come, I couldn't care less as long as people at that point in the movie are enjoying the film. Right. But it is certainly the longest one ever. 
you know, I think an important thing about the pre-title sequence was that Bond be in it yeah. because of its length. And when I talk about the length, I'm talking about a story that was in the script. We knew that the teaser, as we would call it, would encompass several scenes to make this whole long sequence. And that a big challenge for ours would be, how do we make it exciting? How do we make it emotional? But how do we make it efficient? How do we make it as tight as possible? Because we know from the script that we are kind of on borrowed time, you know, the meter's running. And Ellie and I had a lot of conversations about, could we remove this? Could you remove that? Ultimately, we both came to the conclusion collectively that the bones of that sequence needed to all be there. In other words, neither of us were in favor of taking young Madeline and putting that somewhere else in the movie. Both of us didn't like that. And we were concerned that somewhere along the way, someone would suggest that or want to do that. And I just want to point out, by the way, that Carrie and Michael Wilson and Barbara Broccoli really kind of stuck to their guns and really did not ask us to move those things, which, you know, when you're embarking on the, a new collaboration with people, you don't really know what they're, what they're thinking might be. And so Elliot and I, as editors, we're so used to getting notes about, why don't you take this out? Why don't you trim this? Why don't you lose this or move this around? We kind of expected that that would happen at some point. But, you know, Carrie and the producers really stuck to what they believed in, which was what the bones of what was in the script. And so at some point we talked about every, probably every possible option. Like there was an idea of, could you bring the title sequence up right after the ice? But then you'd get a Bond teaser without Bond. And that's been experimented with, with other movies in the past. And it's, it's usually been deemed not very memorable or successful. So that was kind of out the window. And we did feel strongly about starting with Madeline on the ice and in the house, because we both loved the idea of how disorienting it was, and also that it was important backstory. But then once you get in with Bond, you kind of have to play out that whole Italy story all of the action, all of the romance, and then, the, and then the betrayal and needing to end on them saying goodbye. That was really the right point. So in terms of what changed, I mean, I think that all the scenes remain, but I think the scenes themselves became simplified. Things like Bond on the motorcycle, speeding back to the hotel, that became much more truncated. Even the car chase with the Aston Martin DB5, that used to have other elements in it that that and that became more simplified. So everything along the way became more simplified. Things in the house actually became shortened quite a bit. The second Bond trademark is that main title sequence, which is always a mini movie unto itself with these very highly stylized visuals. It seems like the picture editors don't often have a hand in the creation of these, but because it's such a signature piece of the Bond legend, did either of you factor into the title sequence? And if not, is that something you'd like to do or don't care to do or have ever done before? Um, I've designed title sequences before or been a big part of designing them. And um, on this one, we didn't, but we were part of the group, including Carrie and Barbara and Michael and Greg, um, who uh, uh, gave feedback and threw out ideas. Yeah. But in no way did we create it. Yeah, the great Danny Kleinman. Uh, I think that was something that was really special to all of us, getting to kind of get in a room and look at some of his rough versions and give feedback. So, you know, we didn't really have any overt hand in big designs or anything like that, but our feedback was always sought. And, you know, we were always giving thoughts and talk about things we liked and talk about things we didn't like. So, you know, with that history, with 24 movies, you can't help but be reminded of elements and tropes from the earlier movies. And sometimes we would all really love that because it touched on something like from Honor Majesty's Secret Service or, or something vague, even if we didn't know what Bond movie, vaguely Bond, we were like, that's great. But then that was not always the case. Sometimes we'd see elements where it was like, I can see how this feels a little bit like this era of Bond, but it's not really what we're going for, you know? So when it comes time for setting up your, your working environment, you know, how your Avid is set up, how your room is set up, you know, I'd like to know what each of you require, what you like. So Tom, I thought we would start with you on this one. And also any uh, unusual accoutrement of your editing suite that you must have, because I'm looking at a picture of your editing suite from First Man, and it's very organized and, and kind of Spartan. Maybe you cleaned up that day. Probably. Um, 
I think Ellie and I kind of had very similar editing rooms actually on, yeah. on Bond. I mean, we both, you know, were set up to monitor in 5.1. It was the first show that I did cutting in 5.1. Elliot had experience doing it previous yeah. and really liked it. And we talked about it and he really was in favor of it. And, and that was all I needed to know. I liked the idea. So we were set up for 5.1 and we both had very large kind of client monitors, I think probably 85 inch for basically carry and producers to look at. And then we had a standard kind of, well, standard two monitor Avid setup. I think we also had a third monitor that we would use for the Avid script, a dedicated monitor to the Avid script. So that was something that might be a little bit off the beaten track. And we both had uh, artist mixes. And I think other than that, we didn't have anything too crazy. I mean, uh, it's funny. It depends on the director I'm working with. I do like to have things a little a little more Spartan. But, you know, again, it depends on the director. Um, some directors I work with really camp out there. So it's not um, unusual to find, you know, boxes of Chinese food or pizza or something <laughs> sort of sitting around. I think the other thing is I always really love working with uh, picture wall cards. I personally uh, am a little lost without them. It really helps me remind myself where I'm at in the movie and it helps me talk about scenes in the movie with the director and with producers and with crew. And so that's something I like to have on my wall and that's something you'll see there. And other than that, I think at Pinewood where we started and then in, in our cutting rooms in Soho, I think we just had a couple James Bond posters on the wall for added inspiration, I guess. What about you, Elliot? I'm one of the least uh, needy editors in terms of technical stuff in my room. I don't uh, care too much. What I do like is a warm environment. <laughs> so I like it to be warm and cozy, not sterile. But um, I like to have my... Uh, I don't like people behind me. I like to have uh, sort of, the, you know, my avid bench off the left uh, or right and the uh, director, producer, a couch, uh, uh, you know, uh, parallel to me. And we can both look at the TV and we can turn and look at each other like a conversation rather than a typist for somebody telling me what to do behind me. It's just having somebody over your shoulder is not the best way to have a creative conversation, in my opinion. I know. But that's for me anyway. Um, that's all I care about. 5-1 came out of this. My friend Craig Wood, who's edited a bunch of Marvel movies and Gore Verbinski movies, is a soundaholic. Now, I do, I've done all my own sound to the nth degree since early on. Um, and I love it because I think sound, music, and picture are a dance. And um, I want to work on all of them while I'm doing my rough assemblies. But I'd worked in you know stereo and LCR. Um, and and um, then with Marvel, I moved to 5.1 and, and on Bond, in part because Craig now works in 7.1 <laughs> because he's insane. Uh. But it does sound uh, spectacular. Um, Honestly, I'm happy with stereo or LCR really these days uh, for most things. But when you have a movie where there's so much action and, you know, uh, cars going this way and that way and from left to right, it's sort of fun to create the experience and also to allow the dialogue to pop in that center channel. If you're, if you're moving the sound around, you really can create a more atmospheric experience that does, in fact, affect the director's you know, perspective of their own film. So movies of this size and this scope require a large team of creative professionals, that's obvious which made this comment that I read from actor Ben Wishaw, who played Q, all the more interesting. He said what was amazing about the way Carrie worked was that it felt like an indie film. Mm. And before I finish the rest of Ben's quote, I'll say that I guess I could see that playing out on set with the actors and the crew there, but not so much in the editing room, but you guys both certainly know what an indie film feels like. Right. Does No Time to Die qualify as an indie movie for you in any way? No, it didn't feel like an indie film in any way, shape, or form to me whatsoever. The only way in which I could say it is that to family environments. It feels like a gigantic movie that is not an indie film in any way, shape, or form. And um, I can't speak to Ben Winshaw's perspective, although I love him. But, um, you know, I'm sure Tom has his perspective on it. I'd love to hear that. I mean, it, and I agree with Elliot. Uh, no. Um, but at the same time, you know, th this is going to sound like a total editing room storytelling cliche, but it is all about emotion and the characters, you know. So whether you're cutting your $3 million movie where that's kind of all you got are the, are the characters and, and, you know, and their character arcs. Cause you don't have big set pieces. You don't have Aston Martins, you don't have explosions, 
um, that's all you have. But one of the biggest important things about No Time to Die was really Daniel Craig's Bond, you know, so it really would kind of come down to some of the same stuff. And something I remember Barbara Broccoli distinctly telling me and Elliot when she came into the cutting room early on is that she just reminded us the movie needed to be emotional, you know, and she knew that it's a Bond movie and a Bond movie has to function a certain way. People will expect a certain amount of action. They're going to expect a certain amount of glamour and globe trotting. It's going to be big. All these movies are big in scope. She knows that that goes without saying. But the big thing that she wanted to remind us about was just make it emotional. So in that way, indie movie, big Bond movie, you're kind of leaning on some of the same stuff. Well, the rest of what Ben said was that there was a lot of improvising and that they didn't do many takes. So that's how, kind of how he qualified his comment about it being an indie movie. Oh, well, they did do a lot of takes, by the way. They didn't do a lot of takes on Ben's last takes of him in the airplane while Bond was running around the island. That's what he's referring to. Tom, you mentioned the uh, script sync monitor that you have, the dedicated script sync monitor. Ben said there was a lot of improvising. Would you say there was a lot of improvisation in the performances that you were getting, and, and how does that impact your work with script sync? Um, this movie came with a certain amount of storyboarded and pre-visualized action, but in terms of anything that was off script or ad-libbed, you know, that's something that the assistant editors would really take the time to note in the Avid script. So they would really transcribe what some of that change stuff was. So it was always notated and always marked in the Avid script. So in that way, we always had a, a very accurate roadmap of everything that was shot and everything that was improvised or ad-libbed. I know a lot of the Q and M and Money Penny and Tanner scenes in London were things that were moved up in the schedule to kind of help the challenging schedule when Daniel hurt his ankle and we couldn't shoot certain scenes with Daniel. So we moved a lot of that material or that, that material got moved up and shot often before some of, some of the connecting storylines were really fully ironed out. So, so a lot of that material you know, Elliot and I kind of found the right way to cut that stuff in the cutting room with Carrie. That stuff was a little more loosely structured to begin with when it was shot um, and, and how it was scripted. And we kind of fine-tuned that quite a bit in the editing room. And in fact, it was going to be fine-tuned anyways because a lot of that stuff had to do with exposition that just got more finessed and evolved as we got things like computer graphics that would help tell the story. But having the Avid script list all those milestones and changes helped quite a bit. How many cameras was Carrie usually running for both, you know, the dialogue-driven scenes, you know, the basic scenes, mm. as well as the big action scenes? I think for dialogue stuff, he was pretty conservative, really just two. Maybe there'd be three, um, but often two. Um, and I think part of that was, was probably just the way Linus and Carrie look at things. I think they have very specific ideas of how they want things to look photographically. I think they get allergic to compromising. Not that you always compromise, I mean, uh, but when you do more multiple cameras, but I think they, I'm guessing they felt that it was more manageable and also they could still retain the photographic quality and the blocking that they wanted. So the dialogue stuff is pretty simple. Even the action stuff, because Carey has a style of storytelling with the camera that's very fluid. He does like to do long takes, or even if they're not long, he likes to do certain, um, tell the story with the camera in terms of movement. So he would have a lot of um, pre-planned stuff that way. Um, now, it, it, it wouldn't, sometimes those little pre-planned shots would overlap. And so you would have you get in the cutting room, you have to make a choice. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a predetermined cutting pattern, you know, uh, but he wouldn't go crazy with a lot of cameras. I mean, I, I, what comes to mind are some of the scenes where there was more um, second unit needed um, and they would shoot a little bit more. I don't think we ever had anything that was like, 10 cameras or 12 cameras. I mean, an example of something, and Elliot, you'll remember, you'll, you'll remember more of this too, so help me out. But, sure. you know, like the in Italy, the bike jump, you know, like 
the bike riding around the Italian streets and, and jumping up into the plaza and stuff. But as a, as a rule, like a fight scene, there really weren't too many cameras. Um, and a lot of that had to do with how Daniel Craig likes to shoot those fight scenes. But also some of those, there are sequences, fight sequences that are designed to look like a one -er. So in that case, it was the opposite of uh, kind of having multiple cameras. Ellie, do you remember anything like that? Yeah, Terry will shoot lots of long fluid takes because he, he he likes the fluidity of camera movement, but then there'll be a lot of fluid takes of different angles and you can still find a way to make it, you know, more cutty if that's necessary or more fluid if you want that. And there are scenes where there was tons of footage in second unit and I had two weeks of material from two different units and then there were sequences where, yeah, he did four takes instead of 12 takes and he had two cameras instead of five. So it was not the most, nor was it the least. Yeah. No Time to Die certainly delivers these big action set pieces, but being the swan song for Daniel Craig as Bond, you would expect there to be more emotional notes than possibly a traditional Bond film. You guys have both done big VFX stuff, Tom, you with First Man, Elliot, you with any of the superhero stuff, X-Men United to Captain Marvel, but you also both have a foot firmly planted in the dramatic world. Do either of you find a particular type of scene to be more challenging or more rewarding, possibly, for you personally as an editor? Okay, well, my career started with X-Men 2 and Superman Returns. That's not entirely true. I mean, there was an independent film I did before those, and I did 100 music videos and, you know, Pilot for House and The Greatest Game I Ever Played. But I was an action guy. That's a, that was the perception. But that was in my 20s, and I got into film in love with movies from Raiders of the Lost Ark and James Bond to, you know, The Godfather and Merchant Ivory and Bertolucci. And there was no possibility in my mind that I wasn't going to aspire to make all kinds of films and to push myself as all the filmmakers and editors and cinematographers who I love had done, push themselves. And, you know, I was told early on, oh, you know, that's going to be very hard. And I went, uh-huh. And getting here in the first place was hard, you know. What are you saying? And I, you know, so I was told I could only be an action guy, which is why, to a certain extent, I went off and said, well, I'm, I'm only going to do drama until somebody takes me seriously. And Milk changed everything for me, and, and, and Gus Van Sant gave me a huge opportunity, and he's a wonderful man. And, and then I st stayed with dramas for quite a while with um, Steve Jobs and Molly's Game and Trash. Most people haven't seen it. It's in Portuguese, but Stephen Daldry, who's one of my favorite filmmakers, directed it. And then it was like, having it's actually an action film but reminding people um that you can do action and then you come back and you do captain marvel and, and james bond but it's sort of funny to me uh, and not in a mean way but it's just funny that people think oh you're this oh now you're this you're not that anymore no we're all storytellers and frankly telling a drama and telling an action film to me are the same thing they're, they're telling a story and finding a rhythm and a pace and it doesn't particularly matter. Um, now, maybe somebody's particularly gifted at kinetic energy, maybe somebody's particularly gifted at performance, but, you know, I'd like to think that I pay equal attention to all of them and care about all of them and love doing all of them, and I wouldn't want to do just one of them. Yeah. You know, some of my favorite stuff are some action scenes, but also some dramatic scenes. And the amazing thing about Bond these days is that there is more emphasis on character. And so there's a depth of emotional character stuff that you can't help but want to explore. Um, it's less of maybe an impression the way the old, old films were. They would sort of give you more an impression of these characters. Here, it's all about really digging in deep and, and looking for a different kind of richness. And so what's amazing about current Bond movies is you don't just have a great character actor, uh, international character actor playing a villain, you've got Academy Award winner Rami Malek playing a villain. Uh, and on top of that, you've got another Academy Award winner, Christoph Waltz, playing another villain. So the movie is inhabited with such immense talents that as an editor, it's kind of a joy to kind of work on. You know, one thing I really love as an editor is to work with performances, you know, and uh, it's fun to cut action stuff or more kinetic stuff. But it's for me, it's it's equally fun to cut, you know, cut a scene with Blofeld, you know, um, just a back and forth, a dialogue scene between two characters. Well, I'd like to combine the two types of scenes and ask you guys about keeping up the pace within a dialogue scene. For example, in Bond's reunion with M, uh, I felt like I noticed that quite often you wouldn't see a character begin or end a line of dialogue. Again, that's just going off memory. If that was the case, 
Was that a conscious effort at a technique generally used by editors to create a little energy within dialogue? And does the dynamic or familiarity between characters influence how you guys cut their dialogue? Well, I'm sure Tom has his own perspective, so um, I'll let him take that. But for me, I don't have any particular philosophy. Uh, but look, I've cut two Aaron Sorkin scripted uh, movies, and uh, that's rapid fire. But there's a real power in, first of all, you basically, you don't stop for a breath, except when you do. And you realize how much power there is when you stop for a breath, when you make that choice. And you can make that choice wherever you want. And I certainly learned from those experiences and apply it to, to other films of any kind, which is you really don't necessarily need as much space between the lines as you think. And it gives more power to a moment when you're not giving as much space all the time. But I certainly have no particular philosophy. Each film uh, tells you what it needs and you, you, you service that. Right. The characters and their relationship definitely factors in. I mean, knowing that uh, Ray Fiennes and Daniel Craig have been playing these characters for a while now, knowing that they have a bond, uh, no pun intended, but they have, they have a relationship and a shorthand and a history, you know, you want to play off of that. So you can't help but be informed by the previous interactions in the previous films, I think. And so that does factor in, in terms of how, cheeky bond is or how one of them winds up the other one that absolutely factors into it but you know in, in terms of in terms of when we stay on a character you know it's it really is um and ellie and i would talk about this all the time it really is about finding the best pieces of performance yeah. and picking picking those pieces and holding on those pieces yeah. that you think really um, are strong and speak with a certain sort of emotional honesty. You pick those pieces and you build the scene around them. You know, so if you've got a great stretch of Ray Fines, you want to keep that. You want to keep it on screen or build to it. You know, it's all about teeing up to those great moments that you find and build around it. And so that will govern how long you stay on a character. That'll govern if you have lines that are off camera, you know, off screen, a lot of times, and this is, this isn't specific, certainly not specific to bond. It's, it's kind of all editors do this, I think where when there is a line that's important and you really want the audience to clock it 99% of the time, you'll want to see that line on screen so that the audience is getting that much more information to clock it. And the audience subconsciously knows that there's an importance to it. That's why you're showing it as well as hearing it. And in order to do that, you want, that will affect your cutting pattern leading up to it and following it. Because you don't want to just stay on too much before and too much after, because then you risk that important piece of dialogue not being registered as important. So for the first time in a Bond movie, IMAX cameras are employed. For you as editors, is there anything you have to do differently or be cognizant of when working with IMAX and 65 millimeter as sources? I think, you know, both on First Man and, and No Time to Die, I think it couldn't help but inform how we cut it in subtle ways. I mean, I think that, I think out of the gate, you know, I know, speaking for myself, I cut it the same way I would cut something in 16 millimeter. But once it's put together, I have to kind of then turn on a different part of my brain and really analyze it and think about it and look at it and know that it's going to play on a screen much larger. And so it's going to be bigger. And that might affect the way you cut, how long you hold on a shot. Yeah. But the other thing is the information. You know that there's going to be so much information, so much resolution you know, that will, will invite you to like linger on things a little bit longer. It also means that you really have to scrutinize things like visual effects because you're going to notice things more. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. I would say with IMAX, you might not cut quite as fast because it can be a problem with IMAX, but mostly that wasn't a thing we had to think about. You might hold a little bit longer on a wide shot. There might be a thing. Mostly I try to cut it exactly as I would any other sequence. And then maybe go and look if there are a few things that might be perceived as too fast in that giant screen. But I'll start out by cutting it just how it feels natural, um, and I don't take it into account. 
Well, we talked about the change in directors before the film got underway, really. But there was also a pretty big change during post-production, and that was Hans Zimmer coming aboard to take over for the music. Where were you in the process of integrating the score, and how did this impact you guys in editorial? Well, in some ways, I mean, it was, it was, it was another dream come true to have Hans come on because, you know, uh, I think both Ellie and I are big fans. Yeah, um, so I mean, we were lucky to have Hans, and he's amazing and one of our heroes. Um, and again, I know there are people with philosophies that the picture comes first, and I come from no philosophy other than I think of it as a dance between music, sound, and picture. And Danny Boyle would tell you, of course, music matters. If you toss this track on a scene, all of a sudden it gives you license to cut it a whole new way. Perhaps that might be better. So I like to cut with music and sound, and I do a ton myself. We also had the brilliant Oliver Tarney giving us sound early on. The reason I'm mentioning sound as we talk about pictures, again, to me it's a dance between the three of them. So as I'm putting a rough cut together, I'm absolutely trying different pieces of music and playing with sound. The music component, you know, you hone in on a vibe as you go, and we played with music from past Bond films from back in the day. We played with everything you can think of. But pretty early on, I started tossing on Zimmer, and so did Tom. And I'll sometimes mix two tracks together. because He has a lot of tonal stuff, and maybe I'll take some of his tonal stuff and mix it with a little bit of you know old Bond thing. And you sort of start to come up with a vibe. And then Hans comes, and maybe he likes that vibe and runs with it. Some of it's his anyway. <laughs> and then sometimes he'll take it and come up with something absolutely new and refreshing and brilliant. And so we were thrilled to have him. Yeah. You know, the truth is, in some ways, we just continued doing what we were doing because by that point, we were already temping with a lot of Hans's music, whether it was from Dark Knight or other pictures. We tried a lot of different things. I mean, certainly there were little odds and ends we would pick out from the David Arnold scores. But, you know, Carrie actually, at some point, wanted us to try some really old scores, the old scores that John Barry did for some of the older movies in the 60s, in particular, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which was a Carrie favorite. He pushed us to try some things there. And, you know, often what we found was that that would work for certain places but we really needed some more propulsive stuff and some more stuff where you would really feel a certain, you'd feel a certain mood or tone in your gut. And that's where it was very easy to turn to music by Hans. By the time Hans came on, we had already been temping with Hans. So in that way, it's not like we really had to shift gears. We just kind of continued moving forward. So as we start to bring things to a close, one thing I want to touch on is assistant editing. And, you know, what you look for in an assistant and how you made your way up the ladder in editorial. And I certainly asked this question a lot. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to ask a very highly regarded editor, Tim Squires, about a young assistant in his cutting room that went on to be a pretty decent editor. And here's what Tim had to say. You know, there are people who are career assistants and there are people who are assistants who go on to become editors. And I've, for whatever reason, always, always hired the second type. The kinds of people who I tend to hire are people with who are a good presence in the editing room, who are, seem smart and pleasant. I think my first assistant on the first film that I worked on with Tom, named Susan Littenberg, I think she found Tom, as I recall, quite a long time ago. But uh, yeah, bright, motivated kid. And um, you know what we would do back then is I, I would cut multiple versions of everything, and then I'd bring my assistants in the room and I'd show them to them. And we talk about them, and then I'd go and cut version one. And, you know, those discussions were really interesting. And Tom wouldn't come in and say, oh, it would look good, you know. He'd be engaged and said smart things. And that's the thing that really struck me about Tom is he really paid attention. Wow. Well, there you have it. So clearly wow. the, the Tom in question is uh, I'm, <laughs> is our, our good friend Tom Cross. Well, wow. uh, Tom, just first your reactions to Mr. Squire's comments and then just how you've, what, what you learned from him back then. Uh, it's, that's amazing to hear, um, <laughs> Matt. That really did catch me by surprise. Uh, I didn't expect to hear his voice. You know, it reminds me that so much of what I've gotten and so much of how I try to work is deeply inspired by Tim. And I might not take any very specific methods, but it's a general um, it's a general inspiration that I take from Tim. I mean, Tim is so what I remember is he was extremely methodical, and he would he would be very collaborative in that he wanted his assistants, me 
and at the time, you know, me and Susan Lindenberg, he would invite us into the cutting room. I remember that distinctly because Tim and Susan Lindbergh hired me on my first union job in New York. And I remember dreaming about being in that editing room with the editor. And I really wanted to see and witness what that person did. And so when Tim started to invite us in to look at cuts and give our opinions, I mean, that was another reminder that I was exactly where I dreamt of being. And, you know, I try to do that in my own sort of clumsy way, you know, like, I always want to invite my assistants in to look at what I'm doing. Maybe I don't do it for every scene, but I definitely want their opinions. I want them to be engaged. And I've been very lucky to work with crews that want to do that. All that being said, you asked about what I look for in assistance. You know, I definitely, um, I assisted for many years and all the nuance and detail of running an editing room and trying to anticipate what my editor needs and wants. That was something I took great pleasure in doing. I loved being an assistant editor up to a certain point. When I was bitten by the bug and wanted to kind of um, move out on my own, then, then all I wanted to do was cut. And as an editor, I've now moved into that place where I don't want to micromanage my crew or micromanage them. I want to be surrounded by a crew that protects me from myself. So I want assistance and a crew who will, you know, who will represent the editing room well diplomatically, but also, you know, and have good relationships with other departments, but also a crew that know what to look out for in terms of what production needs and what departments need. And again, I, I want, you know, I'm, I can be my own worst enemy. I can get caught up in my cutting and not want to think about how the sausage is made, it, but it's my great assistants who kind of keep me honest and you know protect me from myself. So that's that's something I want with the crew. But I also think of assistants, and this is the way this comes from Tim Squires. I also think of assistants as my advisors. You know, they have something creative to say, and I want them to have something creative to say. So that's why I call them in in the room to help me to help me look at things while I'm cutting. Well, I would love to play a clip of me interviewing an editor that uh, Elliot assisted back in the day, but Elliot, you have no assisting credits, which is not <laughs> entirely unheard of, but still, um, you know, the earliest credit I could find for you is as lead editor of a film called The Last Minute. Uh -huh. And then two years later, you're cutting X-Men, you know, X2 X-Men United with Oscar-winning editor John Ottman. Um, so, Elliot, I'd love to know more about how you got your start as well as what you look for in an assistant and how you try and bring them along. Um, I got a very lucky break. I would have been a terrible assistant. Uh, it was like this. There's a wonderful editor named Mark Goldblatt, who I uh, adore, who you probably know or know of, who had cut you know, many James Cameron films, including Terminator, Terminator 2, and uh, he's just one of the all-time greats, uh, particularly in the action genre, and I um, uh, did not know him. But a <laughs> parent of a friend uh, from high school had dated him or knew, known him 25, 30 years earlier, and put me in touch, and I sort of stalked him for a year, and eventually he had lunch with me my, you know, about a few months after I moved to L.A. from New York from college, and, and um, he just was like, please stop calling me. And, you know, we went to lunch, and, and I guess he didn't think I was a complete idiot uh, because um, you got a call from James Cameron, whose friend Steve Norrington was a visual effects person who became a director, directed the movie Blade with Wesley Snipes. He was doing an indie film. He was going to cut it himself. They had already shot it in London. And uh, it was non-union. It paid like 500 bucks a week. And um, the only person Mark could think of to recommend to assist him was um, me, because everyone else was union. Uh, I was union, sorry, union, but I, um, but I hadn't started working yet. So I was more than happy to take $500 a week. So he was editing him himself. And um, there was an avid down the hall, um, and they were not connected via a Unity's end. It was left over from Titanic. A few years later, we were cutting out of Lightstorm, James's, Jim Cameron's uh, company. And um, I just asked the director, Stephen, like, we were, he's a workaholic. We were there seven days a week, 18 hours a day. But in my spare time, could I cut? And he said, yeah. So I started cutting in my spare time, of which there was little. And after a while, um, I'd worn out my welcome on my friend's couches. So I started sleeping on Jim's couch at Lightstorm, and I would get up before security showed up and I'd go to bed pretty late. 
sometimes Cameron found me with my feet up on the conference table watching like the West Wing. Um, but <laughs> I just said, hey, you know, working late, thought I'd take a break. And he was very nice about it because he admired the hours. Little did he know I was sleeping on his couch. And um, we worked on that film for 15 months. And about three months in, Norrington, my still good friend, said, you know, you cut faster and I kind of like your scenes better, so why don't you keep cutting? He did not offer me full credit. He just said, keep cutting. And uh, I brought on a friend for a couple hundred bucks <laughs> from New York <laughs> to help me assist as well. And uh, at the end of 15 months, uh, he mocked up some fake uh, credits and said edited by Stevie Norrington and Elliot Graham. And I adore him to this day for doing that. I also would have killed him if he hadn't because <laughs> I cut two-thirds of the movie. But he taught me so much, and I learned so much from him. And uh, that did not get me a bunch of films. But uh, all my friends, I'm, I'm honestly, assistant editor friends said, you're being used, you need to get to know editors because they're the ones who are going to give you assistant editing jobs. And, and I didn't say anything, but in my mind, I thought, well, no, the people I want to get to know in this particular case are directors because directors hire editors. I couldn't say that because it's very arrogant for a kid, but do most people get into assistant editing to be assistant editors? Probably not. So my thought was I have a director who directed Blade who's having me edit for him. I don't care how much I'm making. I don't care. I don't care. I want to be editing. If I'm sleeping on couches, I'm sleeping on couches. And, um, you know, they thought I was stupid, uh, my assistant editor friends, because I was passing up on several, you know, a couple thousand dollars a week. But, but, but then I did the same thing again for a year. I couldn't get movies. So there was a wonderful music video editor back when music videos were very expensive, you know, big, like Scream, Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson. He did a lot of those videos, and he was tired of editing, to be honest. And um, he would hire some people uh, to come in. And I showed him what I'd done via friends on this um, – flashy uh, uh, sort of uh, indie film for Stephen Norrington. He's a visualist. And, and uh, he said, listen, if you want to cut at night, you can cut these music videos, as, you know, a good chunk of them anyway. And then I'll work with the director during the day. And, you know, my name will go on it. I'll do work on it. But if you do a lot of work on it, you can show it to people, tell them it's yours, and I will back you up. And I thought, that's a good deal. So I cut, and I didn't make money. And um, by the time X2 came around, I had done many, many music videos, and I'd, Stephen Norrington and you know Brian Singer knew each other, and um, I pushed really, really hard to get my foot in the door, um, and I wouldn't take no for an answer, um, and uh, uh, they should have said no, but <laughs> they said yes, and um, I probably take more pride in the assistant editors who I've helped, who are talented in themselves, but who I've helped kick down the door for, because... I did get a start early, but I also had to put up with a lot of pain and suffering getting there from people who don't want the young person there. So if there's somebody who's talented who's working for me, I will back them up and help kick down the door as best I can so we can get their talent out there. So now that the film is behind you guys and it's out in theaters and people can finally enjoy it, is there anything new that you learned from your time working on No Time to Die? Well, the, the special thing on No Time to Die simply was for me that it was, first of all, to work on a Bond movie, but to, it, it was so, so important to me because I so loved Daniel Craig in this role, and I think he did something very special with it and for us, the audience, with it, and I felt like honoring him and his performance was just so crucial, and it felt very important to be of service to him and to the film. And um, all I can say is what mattered to me most in the film was doing right by him by making it the best film it could be. Right. So I would say that I learned something on every project. Bond was the biggest movie that I've ever worked on. And in some ways, one of the most important because I grew up being obsessed with Bond movies. My first memory of a movie period is seeing the movie Thunderball on TV when I was about five years old. I have a memory of James Bond being uh, inside his Aston Martin DB5 being shot at by Spectre agents. And he fires these water cannons at them to repel them. And here we are in Matera, Italy, and I'm editing a scene where James Bond is inside an Aston Martin being shot at and repelling Spectre agents with machine guns. And it's the same, it's the same car. <laughs> so uh, it's that same Aston Martin. So in that way, that was this huge sort of dream come true. But in terms of what I learned, I learned quite a bit with working with Carrie because he works very differently than other directors I've worked with. I learned something with every director. But with Carrie, you know, he likes, he would often push us 
to cut different versions of scenes. He wanted us to think outside the box. And so as an editor, I often, you know, want to stick to my first impressions, you know, and my first impressions sometimes are right. But, you know, he didn't want to pass judgment on, on, you know, your first impression is wrong, but he would just push us to try different, different takes, different, um, show the scene from a different perspective. He didn't even really direct specifically. He just said, just go do it, go for it, you know? And so it was, it was something I didn't expect at first. And it's certainly something that takes a certain amount of time, but it was something I learned that I, I learned an appreciation of that because it forced me to drop my preconceived notions of what the scene was going to be and try a couple little things. And what I found is that I would, um, you know, it's a, it, actually, in some ways, it's not that far off from from what Tim Squires was doing back, in, you know, when I first worked with him. From those different versions, you would it would allow you to see things more objectively or in a different way. And you start calling from all those different versions to kind of make this make this, as Tim calls it, version one, make this ultimate version. Um, so that's something that I didn't really do. I, I remember. Tim doing it, but I didn't really push myself to do that in the same way until I worked with Carrie. And after I did this on Bond, I find that I'm doing a little bit more of that now um, when I'm putting scenes together. If I can muster the time, I'll try something just outside the box, something I think won't work, just to see, just to kick the tires. You know, maybe it's the Aston Martins that uh, Tom talks so lovingly about, but is there a favorite memory that you have from cutting this movie? Um, two things I really loved about this movie, being uh, with Elliot and the assistants, uh, Martin Corbett and Lisa Anderson in Matera, Italy, cutting the Italian stuff. That was some of the most fun I've ever had working on a movie. We got to be in this beautiful location for two weeks cutting beautiful photography, beautiful material, beautiful performances. You're cutting a beautiful James Bond movie. That was amazing. My family uh, got to come out for a week and um, that was that was a dream come true. And another great favorite thing was working with Elliot at Pinewood. And I remember while Carrie was shooting, producers came by to give us a heads up on some some stuff that was shot or something coming down the pike. And they came by to talk to us as producers, but also just to kind of update us creatively and have creative discussions about the story and about the character. And those producers, Michael Wilson, Barbara Broccoli, and also Greg Wilson came by and they were so lovely to work with and extremely approachable, very collaborative. Yeah. Some of my favorite people to work with. And I just remember talking about this with Elliot that in our editing room uh, were these people, wonderful people, great human beings, the family business, the people who can have complete creative control over the James Bond franchise have had creative control of their franchise since 1962, since the beginning with Dr. No. And here they are, the family business sitting in our editing room and um, coming to talk to us uh, about creative things. Um, and that's something that was uh, very awe inspiring to me. What about you, Elliot? Exactly what Tom said. One is being with Tom in Italy where, uh, you know, we were both in a wine cellar with multi-thousand dollar bottles of wine um, around our avids uh, because there were no editing rooms. We were in a hotel, brand new hotel that was just opening and the only space for our avids was downstairs in the wine cellar. So that was kind of fantastic. Uh. And um, just being in Materia, Italy, feeling the romance in the air, which literally was there. It's one of the most romantic places in the world. The film was shooting there. The film felt like being there. Being there felt like the film. Editing surrounded by Italian bottles of wine. It gets a bit surreal, and that was a wonderful memory. And uh, getting to know Barbara and Michael and the family, honestly, those people are very special. They're special to me. I think they're special filmmakers. Barbara's one of my idols now, having worked with her. And I genuinely will say that my relationship with Tom crosses one of the most important parts of making it for me and the other part is uh barbara michael and greg that family they are just spectacular people and barbara is an amazing producer okay so last question you're each a double o agent in your own right when it comes to editing with that in mind if q could make one editing function slash gadget for you what would it be oh god for me uh 
you know, uh, one thing that, that, that I'm, I'm thinking about right now because I'm in the middle of doing it is when I look at dailies, I have a very specific process that I do. I make select roles and I, I, I take a daily role and I mark it up uh, with marks to represent ins and outs. And I, did, I started doing this on first man and part of it was the type of footage and the amount of footage that was being shot. It, it was my way to quickly go through footage and make selects. Um, long story short, when I make my selects and my polls, I have a bunch of polls that are just these random little pieces that are in a sequence randomly. I love a cue gadget that would somehow put those pieces in order, in script order, so that I could then effortlessly go through and start whittling and cutting and putting the pieces together. That's something that would be a huge time saver for me. And uh, I only think about that just because I'm right in the middle of dealing with that problem. Get rid of the bureaucracy bullshit, move it out of the way so we can just work on the art and make a good film. Uh, that's a good thing, too. All right, we're on it. Perfect. Let me know when you figure that out. <laughs> yeah, those would both be good features. Hopefully Q or Avid is listening. Tom and Elliot did a fantastic job with No Time to Die, and clearly they were a lot of fun to speak with. Big time thank yous to both of them for sharing all of this with us. I do hope you enjoyed it. I know you will enjoy all that the latest version of Avid Media Composer Ultimate has to offer, but you won't really know that until you try it for yourself. Well, good news, Avid has a free trial of Media Composer Ultimate ready for you right now. So whether you've never tried Media Composer before, or you have but you've fallen a little behind, you can get all that sorted out today with the little link I put in the show notes, so give it a shot. And with that, we have come to the end of another journey into the cutting rooms of the most amazing, talented, inspirational editors in the world. Where will we go next? There's only one way to find out. you got to come back for more, and I hope you do. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Guide.